In this lecture, we will discuss the diagnosis and evaluation of heart failure. Heart failure is a clinical diagnosis and therefore clinical evaluation, including a comprehensive history and physical exam, is key. The majority of patients with heart failure present with fluid overload and a normal cardiac output. The next most common presentation is fluid overload and a low cardiac output, and rarely do patients present with heart failure with the low cardiac output without fluid overload. Remember, fluid or volume overload is associated with crackles on pulmonary auscultation, jugular venous distension, peripheral edema, ascites or increased abdominal girth, dyspnea or thopnea, and proxismal nocturnal dyspnea. All of these are those that we discussed in the previous lecture. Most patients will present with dyspnea or shortness of breath followed by orthopnea and proxismal nocturnal dyspnea. The presence of orthopnea or jugular venous distension are most predictive for an elevated pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, which is similar to the left atrial pressure, and this suggests left-sided heart failure. Now, signs that you can look for to evaluate for low cardiac output include cool extremities, a low pulse pressure, and reduced cognition as less blood perfuses the brain and extremities. In addition, you may see worsening kidney or liver function from low cardiac output, but remember, this can be a result of vascular congestion or other causes. Now, the initial diagnostic testing for a patient presented with clinical signs and symptoms of heart failure should include an EKG or electrocardiogram to evaluate for any ischemia or arrhythmia. You should get a chest x-ray to exclude any pulmonary causes of dyspnea that the patient would present with, and natural triatic peptides, that is a BNP or NT pro-BNP, to help establish the presence or severity of heart failure. So let's take a moment to discuss BNP levels because these will come up quite often. Now BNP levels are elevated in patients with increased right or left ventricular filling pressures and systolic or diastolic heart failure. These BNP values tend to be greater than 400 in those with heart failure. On the other hand, those with dyspnea and BNP values less than 100, that is the low to nor normal range, are more likely the result of pulmonary disease. As you can see already, that these values can be quite helpful. In fact, an elevated BNP has a sensitivity for heart failure of 95 to 97% and a negative predictive value of 90 to 97%. That is to say, if the patient does not have an elevated BNP, so above 400, there's a good chance that they don't have heart failure. Now, what if the BNP is between 100 and 400, as we've been using as those range? Well, this gets a bit tricky, as BNP concentrations in this range are neither sensitive nor specific for excluding or confirming the diagnosis of heart failure. You should always also be aware of some common factors that can increase and reduce BNP levels. Kidney failure, older age, so as, the, as our patients get older, and female sex can all increase BNP levels, whereas uh, our obese patients or those with an elevated BMI, often above 35, can actually uh, reduce BNP levels. So that's important to know. And we've been going through these BNP levels here, and we're saying that this can help uh, look for the presence and severity of it. Okay, remember, it can be increased in those with kidney failure, those that are older, in female sex, and then decrease those with a BMI often over 35. Okay, now we said that those that are less than 100, this and they present with dyspnea, this is most likely pulmonary disease. If it's over 100, this uh, suggests an increase in LV filling pressure and systolic or diastolic heart failure. So this is the one that you kind of want to look out for. And this has a high sensitivity and negative predictive value. So that's really important to know. And those that fall in between that range, so this one here between the two, 100 to 400, not sensitive or specific. So you kind of got to do a little more digging uh, to get what's going on with the patient. All right, so let's move forward. A few other labs to consider on initial evaluation include a complete blood count or CBC that'll give you your hemoglobin platelets, hematocrit, and white cell count. Okay, so you really broaden your differential. A 
complete metabolic panel or CMP to check serum electrolytes, kidney and liver function, as well as glucose levels. You should also get cardiac enzymes if the patient presents with shortness of breath or dyspnea, such as troponin levels, and this can help rule out ongoing cardiac injury if negative or show no upward trend over time. Lipid levels can also be helpful in long-term management of these patients. And thyroid function tests, such as a TSH, can help evaluate for hypo or hyperthyroid which can be re uh, reversible causes of heart failure. In fact, manifestations of palpitations and cardiac symptoms from hyperthyroidism may even resolve with its treatment. Another important imaging test to get in these patients that present with heart failure is an echocardiogram. That's an ultrasound of the heart. A transthoracic echo, or TTE, is a non-invasive test and often sufficient. An echo is the primary diagnostic test for evaluation and provides information on the cardiac systolic and diastolic function, the heart size, evidence of any regional wall motion abnormalities, and if there's any valvular disease present. The echo can also provide clues for the underlying uh, physiology or pathophysiology of the patients presenting heart failure. For instance, changes in the myocardium may suggest an infiltrative process as we can see with cardiac amyloid, uh, or it could see you may see new regional wall motion abnormalities that may suggest coronary artery disease or ongoing ischemia. We can also get a prognostic, prognostic information, especially in the setting of a new or severely reduced ejection fraction. It is key to evaluate for ischemia in patients that present with heart failure as coronary artery disease is the leading cause in over 50% of patients in the United States. So this is very important. And it's especially true in the setting of newly diagnosed heart failure. You should look for key risk, risk factors, as we've been discussing, the hypertension, diabetes, tobacco use, whether former or current smokers, male sex, and family history. Now, EKG and echo can demonstrate ischemic causes for left ventricular dysfunction. If patients do not pre do present with symptoms suggesting CAD, that is coronary artery disease, or have a history of myocardial infarction, it would be reasonable to proceed with stress testing or cardiac catheterization to evaluate and potentially treat the underlying cause. Identifying patients with significant CAD is critical as we have percutaneous and surgical interventions that could potentially improve or resolve left ventricular dysfunction caused by ischemia in these patients. All right, let's briefly review what we discussed before we end here. So remember, heart failure, we said, is a clinical diagnosis, okay? So it's really important to know that. And really getting a good history and physical is key. That's what's what going to give you and make that diagnosis. The initial testing, we mentioned EKG, okay, for looking for arrhythmia, ischemia, or any other causes. Chest x-ray, kind of ruling out any pulmonary disease. You actually may see if you see increased enlargement uh, during the acute phase that may suggest uh, congestion in the heart. BNP levels, as we discussed down here, are important. CMP, looking at the electrolytes, the liver function, and glucose levels. Cardiac enzymes, getting those cardiobiomarkers. Troponin is very important. Lipid levels can help with long-term management. And TSH, that thyroid uh, the simulating hormone to, you know, diagnose any acute hypo or hyperthyroidism that may be a reversible cause for heart failure. We also want to get an echo just to get a good idea of what's going on. What is the structural anatomy of the heart? Um, do we have any areas of regional wall motion or abnormality that may be present, any valvular disease that may be contributing to the patient's presentation? We mentioned with these BNP levels, okay, three different ranges, less than 100 in dyspnea, likely pulmonary disease, between 100 and 400, really not sensitive or specific for heart failure, but when you get over 400, this suggests likely heart failure is present, increased left ventricular filling pressure. This is both highly sensitive and specific, or highly sensitive, and it has a high negative predictive value, okay, for that. And one other thing to note is we mentioned that BMP levels can be elevated with those that have kidney failure are old and age, the elderly and female sex, and they may decrease in those that are obese with the BMI often above 35. And remember, it's very important to evaluate for ischemia because coronary artery disease is the number one cause of heart failure in the U.S. Remember, we said over 50% of cases. Okay, risk factors to evaluate for are hypertension, okay, keeping a goal of less than 130 over 80 in these patients, controlling their diabetes if present, present, smoking cessation is very important. Males is another risk factor that, that 
are at higher risk and if there's a family history. Getting EKG, cardiac enzymes, and echo to look for any regional wall motion abnormalities can help to evaluate for ischemia. This is important because remember, PCI or percutaneous coronary intervention, surgical revascularization may improve or resolve LV dysfunction, that is left ventricular dysfunction in those that have it as a result of ischemia. Well, that's the end of this lecture. We discussed the diagnosis and evaluation of heart failure. I hope you learned something.